You're listening to Shakespeare's Sonnets Exposed, episode 13, sonnet 12. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What if I say I'm not just another no. one in your place? You're, You're the, the pretender. pretender. What if I say I will never surrender? Once again, I'd like to thank my patrons for their contributions and as importantly, for showing faith in a project I've been obsessed with and possessed by for years. This podcast episode is a week late, and for a number of reasons. The first is that I've been under some personal stress, which I'm grateful to report has relieved considerably. And the second is that while beginning to analyze Sonnet 12 last weekend, I found myself tumbling down the rabbit hole of Ovid's metamorphosis. Not only could I spend hours and hours collating and clarifying references from the sonnets, which is out of the current scope of analysis, but has certainly left me with a stack of notes for the future, I've realized that reading Ovid's Metamorphosis to my son is way overdue, for myself as much as for him. It is an incredible collection of stories, horrifying and wonderful. So my apologies once again for the delay, and I promise that I am doing what I can to keep my update frequency weekly at the very least. On another note, those of you following the tattoo updates will know that this past week did not turn out as expected, and the next two sonnet images will be done this coming Wednesday instead. We figured out a good way to live stream the process, so if you're interested in watching me turn my body into a representation of the sonnet sequence, then please sign up to get access. I cannot promise you that I won't cry. Right, let's analyze sonnet 12. When I do count the clock that tells the time, and see the brave day sunk in hideous night, when I behold the violet past prime, and sable curls all silvered o'er with white. Time and death are wonderfully conflated throughout the sonnet sequence, beginning as early as the first sonnet. Time is the Roman god Saturnus, conflated in Ovid's Metamorphosis with Kronos. And even today, time's scythe is easily recognizable as the implement of the Grim Reaper. Saturn is the god of generation, dissolution, plenty, wealth, agriculture, periodic renewal, and liberation, all aspects that are explicitly discussed in Shakespeare's sonnets. The word clock in Middle English was geared towards the idea of bells and chiming, as well, apparently, as the ornament pattern on a stocking. Sonnet 12 is a clock that tells the time suggesting that the first 12 sonnets are hours on a clock and explicitly adding a sense of time to the sonnet reading. It informs us that it is now midnight, a time of death and darkness. Just as the sonnet sequence is a mirror with two sides, so is the sonnet clock a reflection. When the sonnet is read, it tells of a particular time, but from the sonnet's perspective, it is the face that reads it that tells the time and gives a sense of its passage, in words, in wrinkles, and in the number of different faces encountered. As has been mentioned before, when the sonnets are not being read, they are enshrouded in the darkness of the closed book and remain in timeless stasis. The adjectives brave and hideous are the words that sent me off on a hunt through Golding's translation of Ovid's Metamorphosis. They're very particular terms and don't appear to be used here in their now ordinary senses. Brave already meant exhibiting courage or courageous endurance from Middle French's splendid or valiant, but hideous meant terrifying, horrible, or dreadful. In metamorphosis, the word brave is generally used as splendid or courageous, but twice describes particular leaves as evergreen and enduring. The word hideous, by contrast, generally refers to frightening storms, to awful noises that characters make when they face unimaginable horror, and to the dragon-serpent python that Phoebus slayed which may prove significant as Phoebus has been an established actor in the sequence since Sonnet 7. When lofty trees I see barren of leaves, which erst from heat did canopy the herd, and summer's green all girded up in sheaves, borne on the bier with white and bristly beard. Herd meant both a quantity of domestic animals, playing into the conceit of livestock and agriculture from the beginning of the sequence, and a uh, keeping care or custody. It is also the noun for the keeper of the herd, as in shepherd. The sonnet sequence is a store of Shakespeare's creations, referenced as treasure since sonnet two, and serves as their custodian. 
Each sonnet protects an aspect of the bard, so the covers of the bound volume and each individual page form a canopy that protects and shelters these reflections. There's an additional pun here, too, with the heard being the collection of sonnets that are read aloud, rendering them heard, and the voice that they lend to their creator, Shakespeare, who is heard through them. To gather up in sheaves is an expression that appears to have emerged from the 1570s, with sheaves being grooved wheels to receive cords or pulleys, and beer meaning a wooden frame on which to carry a load, and a framework on which a coffin or corpse is laid before burial. This quatrain is enveloped in an air of pessimism. The trees are not evergreen. The pages of Shakespeare's poetry, grooved with his pen, are bound and scheduled for burial, or at least to be carried in this coffin of a sequence to readings wherein they will be buried again. And this at the same time that Shakespeare himself is aging, losing the hair that before protected his crown and the thoughts herded beneath it, preparing to be carried to his wintry grave, both in real life and as the protagonist in the story of the sequence. Then of thy beauty do I question make, that thou among the wastes of time must go, since sweets and beauties do themselves forsake, and die as fast as they see others grow. The word question is quite loaded. Its simplified use in today's speech does not account for its history, which included a philosophical or theological problem, an utterance meant to elicit an answer or discussion, torture, and a seeking. It is this last meaning that I find most apt in this context, as Shakespeare has turned his inner beauty into sonnets that must venture into the wastes of time, while he wastes away without a son to replace him. The sonnets are different from humans in that they do not die as fast as they see others grow, but remain static throughout their journey into eternity. That Shakespeare is forsaking himself by failing to replace himself with a son is the truth of one side of the sonnet looking glass. On the other side, we find the sonnets forsaking their creator as they go on their separate adventure. And nothing gainst time's scythe can make defense, save breed, to brave him when he takes thee hence. By the end of the 16th century, the word stroke meant both the mark of a pen and the striking of a clock. In this sonnet's closing couplet, time's scythe strikes with each passing hour. Shakespeare's only son is dead, and his only defense remains in the stroke of his quill. While the sonnets have been recognized and adored by scholars and fans the world over, they haven't enjoyed the same kind of mass appeal as his plays, and Shakespeare's intention for his works was always to appeal to a broad cross-section of society. It is my aim to rescue the sonnets from obscurity, from the darkness, and to that end I am producing a graphic novel adaptation, recording these podcasts, and tattooing 154 images representing the sonnets onto my body. If you haven't already, then please sign up to support me at www.patreon.com slash fisherking, and please join our community discussions on reddit at slash r slash sonnet comics with an x. Thanks for listening. What if I say I'm not no, like I'm the yet. others? What if I say I'm not just another one in your place? You're the pretender. What if I say I will never surrender?